Hello, my name is Grebrenikov Roman, and today we are going to talk about feature storages. And just a short introduction about myself. I'm doing machine learning for quite some time and for different areas, but for the last five years, I'm mostly focused on relevance and ranking in a company called Findify. And Findify itself does uh, search, uh, recommendations, collections, ranking, <coughs> and so on. And it's like a white label thing, so you never notice that one of our like 1,000 stores really using Findify because it looks organic. We have we're not such a huge company, but not a small one, so we have some sort of a traffic. And the talk itself is about how we struggled to build a real-time personalization ranking. Like it's a from the area of learn to rank machine learning models and how we were using Flink for that. And just a, a short like war story about how to uh, run large scale machine learning model on large data sets. And the idea of feature store, the approach, not about the tooling you can use, but mostly about the idea how it can your data process can be designed in a way that it will make your life easier. And the way we try to do it right, we hopefully that's our approach works for us. It might work for someone else or not, but still. And just some future thoughts and ideas about how it can be improved in the future. <coughs> and there's just a short introduction about what is learned rank is about. So imagine that you have a store. It sells pants or maybe socks or whatever. And when the customer lands on this ranking of pants, when you have uh, 100 different pants listed on your website, probably no one will just scroll down for the uni, uh, super, uh, for the best, best matching pan ever. You, you, the customer will just evaluate a couple of pants at the beginning and just call it a day if there is nothing found. Uh, and usually from the business perspective, the better ranking results in a better, in a higher conversion, higher business metrics. Um, and we can use past activity, past customer activity to rank uh, the whole pan set better. But the problem is that uh, most of our merchants are not Amazon, not that large. So they don't have enough historical information about customer behavior. So, and like usually 80% of all the customers coming on the stores are one shot. They came and they go. So there won't be any repeated click history. It's not like Amazon when you can have a, um, your purchase history for the whole of your life. But still we can do something about that because we have information about this, what, what's going on in the session. So when customer came, and landed on the main page, did a search or browsed a collection of socks and clicked on a product, at that moment, we already know quite a lot of different metadata about this customer. So it, he came from Google, from mobile, from the Germany. Uh, this person also triggered the filter for male gender and also clicked on a kit on, on the something from the category of socks and the color of the something was red. So at that moment, we already know quite a lot of different metadata about how can we improve the future search. But how? And when you see the ranking, and you can see it through the prism of machine learning models. So you have a query, you have products, and you can compute a set of machine learning features for each of the product. Okay, for this product, CTR on mobile is 5%, the match between the query and the title is that, and the customer seen that color before or interacted with that color. And you compute all these features for all the products in the ranking. And then in theory, you can just throw it into your machine learning model and just call it a day. But for the training process, you need to have something else. You need to have a feedback. Like, okay, from the historical perspective, in the click, you have a click through. So how customer interacted with this listing of items. So for these four items, customer clicked on two and three and purchased the number three. So then you can just expand it into some sort of a data set for these four items. And you know that the 
third item was the most relevant. The second item was kind of relevant, but not purchased, but still better than others. And others are like nothing. And you also dump some features uh, you know about these products, like from the previous slide, but and train the model. But the problem is with these actual features, because click through when you train the model is happening somewhere back in time. So these features should be also came from back in time. So it's not just a CTR on mobile, but CTR on mobile like half a year ago. The price for the socks three months ago. And do you need to have some sort of a history of these changes? So it's some sort of point in time feature values and you connect them to your items in time. Uh, for example, like a product price, you have, uh, if you do an inference and you need just the value of the price right now, you can't just go to your operational database and get the price from there. But for offline training, mm, complicated. Usually just the main approach, the most popular and simple approach of uh, this case when you have different values of your features uh, in time, you can just log them. You just do a feature logging, store it somewhere, and then later you just load it from your some sort of a persistent storage from S3 and train your model again. But what? Not like this. So you have uh, just a couple of click throughs time and you just log everything which happened at that time with this price. But what if you need to rebuild a single feature when there are some issues with the data being clean? You found a bug, how do you compute CTR, for example? Or you want to bootstrap a feature when you decided to have something new in your model and you need to historically backfill the whole year of data for this feature for the all click-throughs. And it quickly becomes quite complicated because you cannot do feature logging. You need to also implement something else to reconstruct this log from from something else, if you have it. And uh, here comes the feature store pattern. So it's like a dualism of the same um, of the same system. So there is an online part, which is just updates, computes the features in real time from real customer traffic. Uh, and does the inference based on these features. And there is also an offline part where it's usually a data scientist or data engineer working with. It does training this machine learning data, like bootstrapping, backfilling, and there are different ways of accessing this data. So for online inferences, you need just low latency, but the throughput is kind of not that huge, just like a real traffic. And there is also offline, and we don't really care about latency on offline, it's kind of a batch. So you need to high throughput, you actually read the whole history for all the features, for all the click-throughs all at once. That's what you care about while training the data. And if you check the feature storages which are available right now in the industry, they usually solve it with some sort of also dualism of storages. There are two ones for online and for offline and online database stores only the current latest version of your machine learning features your, for your inference. And there is offline with the historical change logs of all the features. And also with the, with the uh, it can also do a time travel. So uh, you can not only take the feature value right now, but at any point in the time, and it can also do a point in time join point in time join it sounds weird but actually it's not that complicated so you have a click happened somewhere here in time on the product number seven and you have like a changes of the price on different time points in your feature store so when you do join you join with the latest known uh, product price at that moment uh, and this point and join can <coughs> can be seen like an easy thing when you have just a single point. But when you effectively need to join everything to everything, like you do for training, 
you have all the click-throughs, you join it with all the features you logged, and then it quickly becomes quite complicated. So for example, for Findify with 10 million searches, 24 products per search, 50 searches in a product, it quickly, or features per product, it quickly becomes really hard just to do the join. And um, we are not the first one who tried to do something like this, to converge to this approach. Like almost five years ago, there was Uber with the Michelangelo Palette feature store, which uh, just decided to separate all the parts of uh, feature engineering. So you have like a database with all the features with the pipelines to build them and pipelines to extract them and to join them with some other data and some sort of a catalog. And you can also have some extra tools uh, like data drift and feature selection on top of that. But still the problem of features uh, like Michelangelo palette is that it was never open sourced. But this year, you can see just a couple of maybe three open source solutions. There is also Amazon SageMaker feature store from closed source and commercial ones available. And uh, but uh, still, when you uh, ask, start, I just personally started asking a couple of people from the across the industry from different companies, do they use some sort of feature stores? And they were like, uh, what is a feature store? And you start describing like, okay, it's a dualism of line online and joining point in time, John. And I thought, yeah, yeah, we do, but we never know that it's called a feature store. So it's kind of a popular idea in the industry. Uh, jokingly, it can be called like a low if your ML system is sufficiently complicated. Probably there is a feature store. You just don't know yet. So if you check out how all these feature stores work, effectively there is just a Python API to access these features in real time, some offline mode, which does this point and time join and time travel and some cataloging functionality. But uh, for us, like for the small company trying to work with the larger data sets, everything was just extremely complicated. So that's a better illustration. And we decided that um, it can be done like easier. So um, we want to have something simple and having no extra dependencies. By, like, by extra dependencies, I don't mean like a Maven dependencies or uh, peep dependencies from Python, but more like an infrastructural dependency. So for example, the Hops works assumes that you have Hadoop cluster with HDFS with some extra filter from the Hops works on top of this HDFS cluster and also NDB cluster at the side, which is possible to install, but still you need to have a team of DevOps engineers to manage it for you. And uh, or you can have pay a company just to manage it for you. The same for Feast, but it's just more about some vendor Loki approaches to, to the data management. And our cost estimation made it, we, we, we got the idea that it's mostly too expensive for us to go with Redshift and DynamoDB, for example, with Feast. And uh, we also observed that uh, the feature types we use at Findify for ranking are not always that simple, but still within the same high level type. So we rarely use just a scholar numbers or strings, but it mostly something more high level, like a counter, how many clicks made by a customer, like periodic counter, number of clicks made into some time window, estimate of the frequencies for countries, for example, or for colors, some numerical statistics, for example, percentiles, and the same with bounded lists. So that's what we usually use and we rarely use just the price. It's more like current price compared to some other prices for the store. Uh, we also need multi-tenancy and other current solutions were like hard with multi-tenancy and we also caring about performance because you know, uh, smaller startups uh, need some weird decisions. Uh, and but we didn't want like to build something which is uh, universal and covers all the needs, like on this slides about like this 
picture about the standards from XKCD. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so we can't just focus on only of our needs to cover our needs well. It can be useful for someone else. Why not? But it's still like a narrowly focused type of feature store. It can have some sort of a tighter integration with the tools you will use. Uh, as we are mostly writing our uh, data pipelines in Scala and on Flink, we can also focus on that. And building something new is always fun. So here comes the Apache Flink. Um, most of the current solutions for feature storages are usually focused either on Spark or have some homegrown solutions how to do this point in time joints and data processing. We decided just to start to build on the shoulders of giants and there are some very important things uh, and points of the Apache Flink, which were extremely useful for us. It's like universal stream and batch processing, this notorious data stream API, but that's uh, have two types of modes of uh, batch mode and streaming mode. And uh, we can also do all the computations uh, holding all the state inside of the Apache Flink. So we, we also always consider it a spark like a like a competitor when you can use it um, with just more widespread. And if you check see how data science era is, uh, which tools do they use in the data science era? It's mostly Spark and not Flink yet. Uh, but still, uh, for our use case, Flink was much better because state, because low latency, and you can do extremely complicated things in the just two to three lines of code with like current Flink DSL. And for the unified processing, the same code can be run both on historical data and on the real time data, but just with a different runtime semantics. But uh, you just do a couple of shots into your head, your foot, and then understand how it works, usually. Uh, so the whole data flow of uh, analytics in in Findify looks <laughs> very simplified like this. So you have a flow of events like telemetry from customers. We do something here and we also store some real time features for our secondary ranking. When we do search, we first generate a list of candidates we want to to, to re rank, then ask a ranker to do a secondary personalization of the search results and count them back. If you zoom in to, to this Flink analytics thing for, um, for the real time part, you will see that uh, from the feature store perspective, it's actually just transforming a domain events like click, page view, and purchase into some actions like transformations uh, of the features. So if you're count doing, <clears throat> if you're tracking a counter or periodic counter, or just sample sampling strings for the frequency, you just send like an increment event to the feature store or like, okay, sample the string for this uh, string frequency distribution or sample this number for the quantal estimator. This feature store thing just writes, updates the feature state and writes the ch to, the, it's to the change log. And also the same thing goes to the ranker for the real time, uh, for the real time ranking. So, um, if you see how it works from another perspective, when you need to bootstrap a new feature, it also looks like this, uh, looks the same, but you just wire things completely differently, uh, but the blocks are still the same. So instead of the real time traffic, you have a traffic log with the same domain events coming. You transform them into some operations on the feature store. They are applied and generated into the change log on some persistent storage. For our use case, it's just S3 files. So nothing, nothing fancy. Uh, and for offline training, it also gluing the same components together again in just a different direction. So we have a traffic log, but instead of generating this operations on the feature store, you already have them here. So you don't need to build. 
you make click-throughs, like just joining searches, clicks, and purchases into a click-through. And then these click-throughs are being point in time joined with these features. And then you just have your training data set at the end, nothing fancy. And you just throw it somewhere like for XGBoost or whatever. And uh, that's literally the whole feature store. So it's have the same dualism of online and offline part for the same code running both offline and offline. And the historical, this feature value change lock is the thing which connects them. But you might wonder, and okay, where is the feature store here? If, like, if you check the diagram of Hop's work solution or Feast solution, you will see that just different services depending on different uh, databases and replication and, and so on and so forth. For our use case, there is, yeah, actually there is no product, no service. And the whole feature store is just a glorified feature value change log. And it, this change log can be read from two different directions for the last version, for the like low latency in machine learning inference, and of, for offline processing for this point in time join. And that's literally the whole feature store. So the feature store which we are currently using and developing is <laughs> can be called like a low code do it yourself uh, feature store because it just takes some data structures in like protobufs so it's just operations on the feature store increment sample append to a list or whatever and it outputs protobufs like daily counts like estimations quantiles top n estimations and that's all uh, there is also two functions for the Flink, the whole, like to do the feature update logic. So you map the input to output and the function to do a point in time join with your domain click through event. Uh, this thing is actually open source and uh, there are even some docs and the examples how to run this thing. It doesn't really looks like a real feature store because it's just a couple of functions which are useful within the Flink to build your own feature store with your own input and output and the way to store the features because it's just built on the shoulders of giants. Uh, it's open source, it's just set of uh, strict functions and there are some extra optional HDFS on ORS3 IO to dump all the change logs or maybe dump them to Redis, but it's still it's still up to you because it's just a do-it-yourself type of a feature store. And itself, it's kind of an, in an early stages of life. We're currently improving it a bit. Uh, it's actually in a production at Findify for maybe a month. So it's not that bad. It still can work. It's also on Maven Central, so we can go on GitHub and see how it, get, how it works. And here comes just a short demo uh, of how it looks like to work with this feature store. So, okay, we have a couple of uh, domain events, like, okay, the metadata events, which just describes our items, like I product ID, its title, inventory count, and the timestamp. There is also an impression event. So we show the IDs of items we displayed, the user who was displayed to a timestamp, and when the user decided to click on an item. So that's literally, literally it. We have two features, scalar features defined for the product titles from the product scope and a numerical estimator of uh, of this inventory counts here. So we estimate four percentiles uh, on the scope of merchant. We do uh, also periodic counters, like how many clicks were made on a product within like in the buckets of one hour. So in one hour, in 12 hours and 24 hours. And uh, the same thing, but just for impressions and number of clicks made by the user. And that's literally all. And here comes the, just the example, the sample itself. So we have a collection of sample events here. So we have impressions click from user zero, then three events about the metadata of what do we have in our um, in our e-commerce store, just 
again, impression for the user one, click metadata update, like inventory size reduced from 50 to 49, and then yet another click. We'll also just assign watermarks here and then map our domain events like metadata impression and clicks into the actual operations which feature store can understand. So we do put like a scholar string into this title feature, put a scholar inventory count on the product count feature, put a like numerical sample of the inventory count to this uh, per merchant merchant wide uh, inventory count statistics. For impressions, we do a periodic increment of uh, of this counters for product impressions for just one and the same for click number of clicks are also incremented by one and we also increment the number of user clicks also by one and here we can just run it and see what will happen here remember that all the features here are updated like in real time but you can set up something like uh, one hour if you don't need that granular updates and here in for the feature list thing, we see the all our feature value change logs. So for example, here comes the statistics of inventory counts with all the percentiles being updated on each events coming in, which is nice. So it's just our feature change log. And then afterwards, we have our click through like user one was displayed these three products clicked on two and three, and we also do a join of this click-throughs and all for that change log. And let's just run it <coughs> later and see what will happen. Hopefully it will work. Yeah, seems to be working. And here in joint values, we have all our, our click-through, but not alone, but with all the feature values after this point in time join. So the latest value at the moment of this click through, which is actually nice. And the thing can be later expanded into something which is, which your machine learning model can understand. But still it scales quite well for us, for 1000 stores it just can process maybe one year of data in a couple of hours. So, uh, that was the demo. And for the feature plans about feature storages, we have a plan to do a couple of connectors so it can be easier to deploy in production and without so much hassle from you. Maybe it can also be extended for Python API because Python is just a lingua franca for data science uh, and just more focus more on docs and examples. And we also have some sort of a future plans, but not about the feature itself as a framework, but more like an application of this framework into a product, which called a uh, MetaRank. MetaRank is just a personalization engine. So it's not just a do-it-yourself glue parts together feature store, but it's already pre-glued, pre-collected pre pre uh, pre uh, solution to do personalization. So you just uh, send some sort of a telemetry there, like clicks, impressions, metadata, and you can train your model on offline traffic log, then deploy this model uh, online to do intro-session re-ranking like we do at Findify. Uh, it's not focused to cover all the cases for uh, personalization and for ranking, but it still uh, tries to match like you know that with 20 percent of efforts you can cover 80 percent of all the typical use cases that's what we're trying to do so it just can't do extractions and conversions of like ctr and user agents referrers per product into some machine learning features and like expand tags and categories also as a machine learning features and use some state-of-the-art current learn to rank models to uh, to retrain them and to deploy and to rank your real-time stream of requests of search requests in real time. So currently, it's it, it it's actually just a glue on top of Featurey, uh, and Featurey itself is built on the Flink 
kernel. So it's for all the data processing for both online and offline and all the connectors, just Apache Flink. So all that stuff is still open source, but the problem is not, it's not yet feature complete, but we're asking for if someone is interested to, to take part and design or just describe the use case, you're welcome. It's, uh, it's available on GitHub. So if you want, uh, you can go and just play with it. Oh, yeah, yeah, it works. You can go and play with it. How can I go back to my slides? Uh -huh, here. Uh, you can go and play with it, but the most interesting part, if you just uh, leave your feedback about how it how it can solve your problems. The feature is also on GitHub. Uh, that's me on LinkedIn if you want to contact me. And I guess that's all. You can ask your questions in the chat somewhere on this website. Okay, I'm answering your questions.